Hi, I'm Tom Davis. I'm Gabby's Senior Manager for Demand and Community Engagement, and I'll be talking today about why correlational analysis of behavioral and social drivers data is important and how to make it easier to do that analysis. This analysis we'll be talking about will be mainly focused on immunization data. However, the same tool can be used to look for correlation for nutrition data like positive deviance inquiries and any barrier analysis studies on other sorts of behaviors as well. We'll start by talking about the background on this and then I'll be sharing the tool with you that we created for this purpose. So what drives vaccine uptake? This is the behavioral and social drivers of vaccination framework. The Gabby Alliance partners have done a lot of work over the past few years to build this framework, looking at the published literature to see what those factors are that often affect vaccination demand. And the most powerful ones are often in the practical issues and the social processes categories, the purple and green boxes that you see here. For example, perceived social norms, that is someone's perception both of what one's friends, family members, and leaders want them to do, called injunctive social norms, and the perception of what most other people are actually doing, called descriptive social norms. If you think that most of your friends, family members, and religious and other leaders want you to vaccinate your child, and that most of them will vaccinate their own children, you're probably more likely to vaccinate your own child as well. Health worker recommendations also fit into this category, as well as gender equity. And we also measure whether women feel that they have permission to take their child to the health facility, which can be quite important as well. Practical issues are the most important, according to the literature, for vaccination at least. And that includes things like whether a caregiver feels that vaccinations are available in their area, whether they are affordable in terms of the money and time required to seek out vaccinations and the lost time from work, the ease of access to vaccination, and some other things like service quality uh, and the respect that they get from the health worker when they seek out vaccinations. There are other things that need to be taken into account in the thinking and feeling box where we talk about perceived disease risk, vaccine confidence, which includes the perceived benefits, safety, and trust. Uh, these are not always seen as being as important as the others, even when they're correlated with vaccination, since often changing them doesn't necessarily lead to an increase in vaccination rates. We'll talk about more about that later. The practical issues and social processes do a better job of that. However, if we want to have support for vaccine policies, this is where it really becomes important, this box on thinking and feeling. That is, if people have low vaccine confidence, they may not support things like vaccination mandates for work in a particular setting. We have a great tool that helps us to look at all of these potential drivers and determinants of vaccination called the Behavioral and Social Drivers Survey or BEST survey. If, one had to, if I had one thing to recommend in terms of improving vaccination demand globally, it would be to use the survey tool, not just at the national level, but at the subnational levels and in zero dose communities, and then to base high coverage evidence-based interventions that address the determinants that you find. So basically doing the survey and seeing what seems to be driving immunization and then doing high quality evidence-based interventions that can affect those things. The five indicators on the right were chosen as the priority ones, and these are the questions related to those, which I won't go through right now. Uh, but these help us to sort out what are the things which are most important. Sometimes people think it's all about motivation and intention, and that people who don't vaccinate their children are simply not motivated. But that's too simplistic. Let's remember that one's intention and ability to vaccinate uh, one's child is influenced by a host of other things and that it can vary by region and area, of course. The most important drivers are shown here. And I'll include a link to the best survey uh, manual um, uh, in the comments for this video. However, I do feel like there's a limitation in the way that this behavioral data is often analyzed and we could do more and better in that regard. Let's use an example that may take you back to graduate school days to illustrate this. Let's say that 100 conference participants were served lunch and five developed food poisoning shortly afterwards. 
How would we tell which of the foods served cause illness? Let's say that 70% of people had the chicken, 20% had the beef, 10% had the vegetarian option, and then there are other foods that they ate as well. Since most people had the chicken, it must have been the chicken that's the problem, right? Well, no, that's not how epidemiology works. We don't just look at the most common thing that people said, and not everyone who eats a particular food that's contaminated will necessarily fall ill. So how would we decide? Well, the way this is traditionally done is looking for correlation between the foods eaten and illness using an odds ratio. So if we found that four out of 15 people who ate potato salad got sick, but only one of the 85 people who did not eat it got sick, then that would help to make the case for the potato salad, that the potato salad was at least one of the things that actually caused the illness. But you would also, of course, need to do the same calculation for all of the foods since it could be more than one of them, of course. In this case, we find that people who ate the potato salad were 30 times more likely to become ill than the who's, who didn't eat it based on the odds ratio. You can see in the little box on the right those calculations. It was highly statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.003. So what I often see is that countries often do this with their best data. This, uh, they don't use odds ratios, but instead they just look at the cross-sectional data, what most people said, and uh, depending on what people said and how, what percentage they basically make decisions on that or what they should concentrate on. And they feel like they have a really good understanding of what's driving something and just take the most common problematic response that they see. But when we look for correlations, sometimes we find that those are not the things that are correlating at all. And so doing this additional analysis can really help us, I believe. I created the barrier analysis methodology about 30 years ago in the Dominican Republic. And its purpose is basically to identify behavioral determinants of a particular behavior so that more effective social and behavior change activities, messages, and strategies can be developed for a particular behavior. It's a formative research tool. Barrier analysis is relatively easy to use approach. It can be conducted in a short period of time over a couple of days and allows implementers to quickly make decisions based on the findings. This method has now been used in 39 organizations and agencies, including UNICEF and many CSOs. It's been used in 59 countries for a host of different behaviors, health, nutrition, and WASH, but more recently, importantly, child protection, livelihoods, education, demining operations, and even the use of trash cans in Baltimore City. So it can be used for a wide variety of behaviors, including immunization. The training manual is available in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. And the most recent one is part of the Designing for Behavior Change Manual, and also in A Practical Guide to Barrier Analysis by Bonnie Kittle. I've put the links to these resources in the comments. Barrier analysis is, a fle is flexible in terms of the questions that can be used with it and the determinants one considers. I've always felt this way. We have a standard set of questions, but those aren't the only ones you uh, uh, need to use. And you can adapt it to different purposes by looking at what do we know about what seems to be driving this particular behavior. So what I'm suggesting is that we could use some of the ways that we analyze barrier analysis data, looking for correlations, and apply that to using the questions that are in the BEST or Behavioral and Social Drivers uh, data survey. This is a screenshot of the earlier barrier analysis uh, tabulation table that I created with support from other colleagues in Food for the Hungry when I was working with them. And with this tool, the user fills in the questions used in the survey and the response categories in the green cells, as well as the counts of people who have given a response among those who are doing the behavior, the doers, and the counts of people who gave the same response among those who are not doing the behavior, the non-doers. By plugging in the total number of doers and non-doers interviewed, you can get all of the data shown here, the odds ratio, its co uh, confidence interval, the estimated relative risk, which is related to the odds ratio and it's actually better to use for this purpose, and the p-value. And for those responses that show a statistically significant difference between doers and non-doers, and that of course depends on the p-value you choose, 
the table generates estimated relative risks and will automatically generate these statements you see here in blue and purple font. For example, in this example, we found that doers, those who were vaccinated or plan to get a vaccine in this case, were two times more likely to say they'd be very serious if someone in their household got COVID-19. Then the non-doers, those who did not get a vaccine and did not plan to get one, conversely, were more likely to say it would not be serious at all or they didn't know. I've added one of the prevalence uh, of belief, I've, I've added on to this the prevalence of the belief in the right column, but it's really these colored statements, the ones that I believe that we're neglecting, the correlations, and that we should be paying more attention to them. This Excel worksheet, though, still required tabulating responses to plug into the green cells. And since a lot of us are now using data tools like ODK, I wondered if we could create a table that would do the tabulation piece and analyze for correlations for us to simplify that. I talked to Sibod Kumar again with Food for the Hungry, and he and his cracking team uh, there worked with me to develop a new, more automated table that I'll demonstrate for you in a few minutes. But let's go back to this question about these cross-sectional findings and correlational findings. Let's look at cross-sectional findings. Through the research I've done on vaccination demand with Heidi Larson and others, I've seen examples where looking at the results of cross-sectional surveys would lead one to a conclusion on where to focus regarding behavioral and social drivers, but looking at correlational data led to a very different conclusion. So on the one hand, you might look at cross-sectional data and say, oh, we really need to work on this issue, say perceived severity of a vaccine preventable disease because X percent gave this response. And yet when you look for a correlation between that response uh, or another in the same question and vaccination, you might say perceived severity is not important in the population, but there are other issues that do appear to be important and that we should be considering by looking at the correlation. So a couple of examples of that. In rural Bangladesh, when we were asked, uh, when we asked what would be the advantages of getting the COVID-19 vaccine, respondents gave the responses you see here with a high percentage mentioning negative side effects of the vaccines. So should we target this in particular to improve immunization uptake? Well, the cross-sectional data definitely could lead one to put some resources into better explaining those negative side effects from COVID-19 and that those side effects are mild and transient, but does it really drive immunization? When we looked at correlation, no correlation was found between mentioning negative side effects and being a non-acceptor or an acceptor of COVID-19 vaccine. 87% of the vaccine acceptors said this and 89% of the non-acceptors said this. So it doesn't seem like it was really driving whether someone wanted to get the vaccine or not. And this is probably, uh, and this probably would not be the best communication to focus, uh, focus to have to achieve the most impact on vaccine hesitancy. Note that this study was done, done early on when we didn't have that many people being vaccinated. So we looked for correlation with vaccine acceptance. But since that time, studies like this have been done on actual vaccination, of course. Another example from rural Kenya, when we ask how serious would it be if someone, if someone who lives in your household contracted COVID-19, respondents gave the answers you see here, with 97% saying that COVID-19 was either serious or very serious. Given that, that almost everyone was saying it's either serious or non-serious, should we concentrate on this at all? Maybe it's not worth messaging around severity of COVID-19 there. Well, not necessarily. Looking at correlations, we found that vaccine acceptors were four times more likely to say very serious, while non-acceptors were 3.4 times more likely to only say serious. So in this rural area of Kenya at least, there was important difference between believing COVID-19 was very serious or only serious. And it may have, may have boosted vaccine acceptance if more people came to believe that COVID-19 was very serious or at least make them more likely to support COVID-19 vaccination policies. Lastly, in rural India, we found that 67% of respondents said that long distances of, uh, to services made it difficult to get vaccinated with COVID-19. But note that counterintuitively, vaccine acceptors were more than three times more likely than non-acceptors 
to get that response for some reason. It could be that people who had actually uh, accepted vaccination had, and some of whom had gotten the vaccine actually knew more about where to get it and then gone to get a vaccine. And they said, wow, that was a long walk. That took a lot of time. So this one also gave us some pretty interesting things that I think we needed to be looking at. So is correlation always important? Well, not always. Addressing correlations with interventions has not always led to increases in vaccination behavior in particular, especially when only addressing some of the barriers and enablers. If you have three different barriers, for example, and you knock out one of them, that might mean the other two are still enough to keep someone from taking action. I'd put a link here to the study which mentions these and other correlations. So looking at correlations may be superior to only looking at cross-sectional data without looking at those, especially for some behaviors and domains. But there are a few things to take into account regarding these correlations and vaccinations. The behavioral and social drivers framework is based on the improving vaccination model, and that model de-emphasizes the elements on the way people think and feel, like perceived risk, in favor of the practical issues and social processes. However, a lot of the studies considered when developing that model were conducted in high-income countries. And I believe we still need to do more studies in lower and middle-income countries on both the behavioral and social drivers and interventions for changing determinants and drivers. Some of those thinking and feeling determinants didn't appear to make much difference, at least in high-income countries, but they may make a difference in lower and middle income countries, and we need to continue to do studies in this area. Also, regardless, uh, the correlations that we know are the most important at this point appear to be the practical issues. So if you see correlations in terms of knowing where the vaccine is available, the ease of access, affordability, service quality, and respect for providers, those are very, uh, respect for and uh, uh, provided to caregivers. Those are very important because we have seen when you change those vaccination rates predictably go up more. Concerning social processes, there's more promising evidence in this area concerning pro uh, provider recommendations, family and community support for vaccination, those so social norms, and also gender equity. And as I mentioned before, correlations of what people think and feel and vaccination may also be important to know. However, sometimes even if you intervene on those and change them, it might not mean the vaccination rates go up. That could be because they're often part of a bundle of determinants. So if you improve those, but don't improve the practical issues like knowing where to go for vaccines, it doesn't really solve anything. Or it could be that improving vaccination intention just doesn't do as much to improve vaccination rates in some setting. Regardless, what we do know is that those thinking and feeling elements like perceived risk, severity, and trust of vaccines can be especially important in terms of generating public support for effective vaccination policies and programs. So we shouldn't neglect them. So we should keep them in mind for that and continue to work on changing those knowing uh, that they are at least appearing to have an effect on public support for vaccination. Okay, so that's it for the background presentation. And in the follow-on presentation, we'll be looking at the correlation tool that I mentioned. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Davis. I'm Senior Manager for Demand and Community Engagement with Gavi. Uh, today is the 5th of August of 2023. And what I wanted to do was share with you today uh, a tool that I developed with some other colleagues for looking at behavioral and social data uh, it can also be used, of course, with barrier analysis and with positive deviance inquiry data. So uh, anything that you're studying where you want to look at correlations, this tool might be helpful. Uh, so let me share that tool with you now. One second. Okay. So this is a tool that we developed for analyzing these correlations. I'll put a link to the tool in the comments. Uh, here are the instructions for that on this first tab. Uh, it might look a bit daunting. There we go. It might look a bit daunting, but I made them concrete and understandable. So hopefully it'll be easier to understand uh, how to use this tool as you go through that. 
If you look at that first instruction, it says use a data set for anal analysis that has a variable for which you would like to examine correlations. And um, if you wanted to see, uh, uh, for example, uh, what eating particular foods, like in a positive deviant study, how that correlates with underweight in a child, you could use this tool for that purpose. And then you need to have a data set on nutrition. But we're gonna be talking about the use of this for vaccination here. For example, the behavioral and social drivers uh, survey, a vaccination survey uh, that has been promoted by WHO and UNICEF and the Gabby Alliance partners. Uh, we really believe in this tool and you can look for correlations between responses to the questions on the priority uh, best indicators or other questions in the best with whether the child was vaccinated or not. Uh, let's look at a what some of that data would look like. This is from a best survey that was done in another country. I won't mention the country name, uh, but you notice in the first row of the data set, uh, you should have variable names, and then the subsequent rows should be the responses of the records. The first thing you want to do uh, with that data is to remove any columns, which you will not need to look out for correlations like the date of the survey, the timestamp. Uh, this had some other columns to the left that weren't going to be useful, so I deleted them. Uh, you can always save the original file, of course, but you delete those. You could de-identify the data if possible. You should, like uh, definitely removing any respondent names or other fields that can be used to identify a respondent uh, because we're not needing that for correlation. Uh, you review the data and make sure that you have removed any rows for which there's no data. So we page down here and we see uh, row K with that. All these uh, rows are filled in. I've already done that step. Now you go to cell A1 of the data set and we're actually going to copy this, okay? We go up here. I'm going to do Control A, and then right click and do Copy, or Control C will do it as well. Then I'm going to go back to my table and go to the database here. And I'm going to go to the first, uh, so that's at V. I'm going to go over to A1, okay, and paste this in. Okay, now this is actually uh, the column that we're gonna wanna correlate against. It's uh, for country name, has the schedule of vaccines. As far as you know, has your child had none of these, some of these, or all of these vaccines. I'm gonna change that to something easier to write down, which is child vax. Uh, so give that a new name, okay? Now we go back over uh, here. And what we need to do is set up uh, this so that it knows where to look for the data, okay? So I go to setup, and I need to choose the variable for the doers, for those who vaccinated their child, and that's child vax. And then the option is just put an equal quote. Uh, we're gonna look for parents that, or caregivers that said their child got all the vaccines, or uh, where child vax uh, equals some of the vaccines, and those should match exactly with what you have there. This is a pull down, but it's either or or and, by the way. And if you choose um, uh, and, it, it basically will look for people that say the first response and the second response. But since we want either of them, we put or for both. Then you go down and set the same variable for non-doers, child vax, and the criteria there is that they said none, right? And even though there's one, you need to choose or here, uh, something to remember. Now the process that we're gonna process uh, every, everywhere from the second column, which starts having data other than the correlation data. And if I would have went out and counted, we had data all the way out to, I believe it was column 39. So I'm gonna put 39 there. Then I need to click go back. Notice I can't get to the other table from here, but I hit go back and that takes me to this sheet. A couple of other things. Um, don't worry about estimated prevalence of behavior. We'll return to that. Uh, but the, the p-value can set that to 0.01 or 0.05. Let's just set it to 0.05 for this demonstration. Okay. Um, then you need to run the program. And what this is going to do is uh, uh, tabulate the data and show us the correlation. So I hit run. And hopefully it will work. Um, this can take uh, several minutes, of course, and I'm just going to let that run for a second.
so this is a, a huge program. It will take a while, but when it's done, it's a successfully pro process. And now you can make it uh, bigger or larger here. We have the percentage of respondents out here, uh, which uh, I, I don't think you, you, you can take a look at that. Uh, that's what you'll get just doing a regular tabulation of BES data. But what we're really looking for is correlations. And they're gonna show up here in the doers and non-doers column. So I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. So you'll note, for example, if uh, what reasons are given for uh, whether uh, for children who were not up to date, that was only asked to non-doers, so it's not really important. How important do you think vaccines are? That's one of the priority best indicators. Note, uh, no correlation there uh, between doers and non-doers. About 98% actually said it was uh, very important, right? How safe do you think it is? Once again, 94% said it was important, no correlation. Do you think most of your uh, friends and family members want you to get your child vaccinated? Uh, that also was fairly high and there's no correlation. No correlation with religious leaders, community leaders. A lot of these that are actually in the thinking and feeling part of best, there was no correlation at all. And you know where to get your child vaccinated, uh, same there, no correlation, even though uh, 15% uh, either said, uh, I know a little, I know moderately, or I don't know at all. It, it didn't seem to matter there for that one that there was no correlation. Uh, let's look down to this one though. Have you been turned away when you tried to get your child vaccinated? With that, uh, let's look at the doers were 8.6 times more likely to say, no, I've never been turned away. And the non-doers were 8.6 times more likely to say, yes, I have been turned away. So that obviously is a problem there. We can go down further. Uh, this one is also uh, a correlation that's statistically significant, very statistically significant at 0 0.004 for the p-value. How easy is it to pay for vaccination? So this is thinking about the cost, uh, payments to the clinic, cost of getting there, cost of taking time away from work. And the non-doer said it's very, uh, uh, very easy to pay for vaccination. So is that a problem? It doesn't appear to be because the people that actually don't have vaccinated children say, oh, it would be very easy to do this. I still haven't done it, but it'd be very easy to. So sometimes you get kind of counterintuitive uh, findings, but I wouldn't brush those off. I think it's important to think about the fact that sometimes the people not doing a behavior will talk about some of the negative parts of doing a behavior, uh, but it might uh, not be correlated in the direction that you would suppose. Okay. Let's go down further. What makes it hard to get vaccination? Um, here's one. The clinic sometimes turns people away without vaccinating. That came up uh, under, is there anything that makes it hard uh, to get vaccination uh, services for your child? Okay. Uh, here's another one. A vaccine is not always available. Um, and this one is also related to that. And then, um, non-doers were more likely when you said when we ask how do you uh how do you hear about immunization services non-doers didn't mention health work uh the health worker the nurse the phone message or radio they said some other method so it could be that they're less likely to have been reached primarily through a health worker a phone message or radio or tv uh but there's some other way they've gotten the message but it doesn't seem to be that effective because they're less likely uh, to get vaccinated. Okay. Uh, and notice that you can also join some of these, like this is a more open-ended questions. What are your suggestions for improvement? Always ensure vaccines are in stock, uh, avail vaccines that are out of stock, uh, avail vaccines always. So what you can do here is just change this to say, um, how about avail vaccines? And I'll put it in caps to remind us that we changed that one. But then I want to go down and join any of these others with it that look similar. That's the same. That's the same. Availability of vaccines is block booking. That's separate. Um, vaccines are always should always be available faster. That's a different one. So you could basically go through and code this using this. Frequent stockout should be avoided. That's very similar. Availability. Approve on availability, vaccine availability. So I'm gonna merge all these together. That one has something combined with it about giving flavor to ORS, but we can go ahead and merge that one. 
approve vaccine supply or check uh, other facilities for availability, still kind of related there. Okay. Uh, that's about being communicated about vaccine availability. We could do that one separately, okay? Um, ordering vaccines on time, that's still vaccine availability, right? And that's about being communicated with about vaccine availability. You could include that or not, but I think let's leave that out. Okay, and the thing is, once you've combined these, then you can kind of look and say, okay, is this uh, something, uh, uh, is this really important or not? So now all I have to do is hit join here, okay? And then I'm going to go back uh, to where that was. And now you'll notice that uh, that would have, and now we have 10 and 17. And yes, non-doers are actually, uh, more likely to say you need to ensure that vaccines are available. So it is highly, you know, it's highly statistically significant and non-doers are more likely to say that. Um, so I would do that with any of your open-ended questions, um, but that's just a short demonstration of what you can do with this tool. I think it's it's quite nice that just even just analyzing your ODK data, going from this to having it all analyzed. And even if you were just gonna use this last percentage of respondents who gave every response, it can be used for that. And by the way, it translates uh, this um, uh, this estimated relative risk into a, an effect size. And I'd, I'd show the study here that was used for that, if you'd rather think about effect sizes. But um, it can be really useful for that. But the biggest thing I think it's useful for is in terms of correlation. By the way, this value here, similar text, you can either set it to say, I only want, I want to automatically combine things that are 90% saying the same thing. It, you can actually set that to 90%, really high, uh, and it, it won't do much combining. But if you set it to like 40%, then it would automatically code together some of these. It's a kind of rough tool, of course, because it, it uses AI, AI for that. But if you had an absolutely huge database uh, and a lot of open-ended uh, responses, you know, hundreds or something, I could see where that would be very valuable. And note that you can always uh, let's go down here and you can change this after the fact. And what you see is actually some of these things that you had uh, that were um, listed here as important might uh, go away. Uh, for example, this one was at 0.02 and we set it at 0 .0, uh, p value 0 0.01 and you see those disappeared over here because uh, they're no longer statistically significant at that p value of less than 0.01. And they come back at 0.05. Oh, and also change this estimated prevalence behavior uh, because this does affect uh, when you go from the odds ratio to the estimated relative risk, like this non doers are 4.2 times. The odds ratio really is not supposed to be used for things that are so common, it's more used for things that are rare. And so I left it at 10%. But if you know uh, what it is, uh, see if I can do that. Um, if you know what the prevalence is, that's fine to plug in. If you don't, you can just calculate it and say, well, we knew that 55 plus 38 people, there are 93 people that we interviewed, 55 and 93, 59% said that they had all or some of the vaccines, their child had all or some of the vaccines. So we changed that to 59. And all that does is it changes this column and it also changes these statements. Uh, so these are more conservative numbers like 1.6 instead of uh, like before when it was 10%, it was 2.7. Um, so that's a, that's a useful step to make sure these numbers aren't inflated, knowing that things we're measuring are often fairly common uh, in terms of the prevalence. Okay, that's it. I hope that's really helpful to you. And uh, you can always reach me at either tdavis at gabby.org if you have questions. Or um, after October, I might be, it might be easier to reach me at tdavismph at gmail.com. Uh, thank you very much.